Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Glad you're all here this morning with us. Uh, just uh, plugging away here. Uh, nothing too new and exciting for me. I usually have some good stories to share during the week, but there's nothing too exciting. We didn't do anything uh, too uh, crazy new or exciting. Our decorations are kind of down, but still up for Christmas. I think everything is pretty much put away except for the tree. Your tree is still up, uh, so we'll see how long that lasts. But if needles are still on us, that's a positive thing. Doc, your tree still up? No, tree's down already. Okay, all right. Well, ours is still up. I could, you know, I, I, I would keep it up, you know, a month or two if I could, but Trina's not going to have that, I'm sure. But uh, it's still up there, still there. But welcome again. Glad you're here. Uh, this morning, uh, we're just going to jump right into today's message. And today's message is ent- entitled Salt and Light. Uh, Salt and Light is today's message entitlement. Uh, we're going to read some scripture here. And then we're just going to go through and kind of unpack what they're talking about and see how we can apply it in our world today. So we go to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, it is on the screen. Verses 13 to 20 says this. He says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with that passage, that verse. Uh, and so what's it talking about? There's a lot of different things in there we're going to cover today. First of all, with the idea of salt, right? What's the idea about salt? If you uh, look at salt, salt in the ancient world, uh, salt was used to preserve things. Uh, that was the, the, the function it had, one of the main functions, right? If, so if you're in the, the, the desert and sweltering heat, uh, Food can go bad pretty quickly, right? So if you have some meat and you're taking it to the market or something like that, it's not going to last very long. And so salt was very important in that region, right? It would, it would preserve the food. It would keep the food from going bad. Uh, and so Christians, if you're the salt, if we are the salt of the earth, what does that mean? What are, what, are we the preservatives of the world? What are we preserving? And, you know, one of the functions as, as Christians, uh, we are to be living in a way that preserves others around us from falling into moral corruption. We see this in the life of Abraham, right? Now, this isn't to say that we are the moral police of the world. So let's be careful and understand that. We are not the moral police of the world, right? When we look at people who are not Christians or people who are rebelling or, or whatever, uh, it shouldn't be all that surprising per se. Uh, and so that's not what it's talking about at all. But rather, Christians, we are to be living in a way where, number one, we're not participating in the sin that we see going on in the world, right? You shouldn't be active participants in that. We ought to be different. Um, but also, we, you're in a way where others look at you in the way you're living and say there's something different about them, and it influences them in a way. You know, you, you certainly see how the way we live impacts people, whether you realize it or not. You know, um, one of the obvious ways we see sometimes is in, in households, right? The way, the way a family interacts and the way parents act often have a big indication of how children were going to um, act. Uh, now, it's, you know, it's not always the case. Sometimes kids rebel and you see all this kind of thing. But that's the first thing is, is while we are not the moral police, right? Our, our job is not to be going around being the moral police of everybody else, but rather just live in a way that preserves um, others from falling into moral corruption. That you are preserving the way God is intending us to live. Uh, but not only that, we, we see in, in the ancient world, um, we are not called to be the moral police per se. We're also not called to try to preserve man-made traditions, right? That's not what it's saying. Uh, sometimes we think that our job is to preserve these, you know, denominational traditions that have been forever. But that's not what Jesus did. If you look at actually what Jesus did, he was a radical rule breaker in many realms in terms of man-made traditions, right? You see the Pharisees and, and the, the elites uh, always kind of um, chastising him for not doing what was always done before, right? He would do things like healing on the Sabbath and eating on the Sabbath they would do and um, all this other kind of stuff. they say, why are you not observing these traditions? And so uh, Christians, our job is not to preserve man-made traditions. Now, they're, they're, we... we we certainly preserve God's truth, but when you start getting in the realm of just like denominational kind of tradition stuff, man-made tradition stuff, uh, we have to be careful that we don't make it like that is the gospel, like that is the way things 
were when Jesus was walking the earth. So that's what he's only talking about. But we are to be the salt of the earth, preserving something that is distinctively different uh, than the rest of the world, right? And we, we see this. Um, what, what do we see Jesus doing? We see Jesus would go and hang out with pretty much anybody, you know? He would hang out with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the marginalized, the, the people that the religious people did not want anything to do with. And Jesus would show them that you have unsurpassable worth. You know, you have value. He would look past maybe what they look like or their behaviors, and he would show them that they have unsurpassable worth and value. Now, that is not saying that Jesus condoned their behaviors or sin, no, but he still looked past that and saw a person he was, it was worth him dying for, right? And so as Christians, we have to keep this in mind. If, if we are the salt of the earth, the way in which we are living should be a way that's preserving God's truth, but also others see it and it influences them, you know? And don't get so hung up on other things you're trying to preserve. Don't get you're trying to preserve the world and their morality. Um, it's, it's a different thing. You don't see Jesus going around and doing that per se. God's truth and morals are his truth and morals, but he wasn't going around doing that. Not only that, it wasn't getting too up on man-made tradition kind of stuff, but rather our purpose, what we can preserve, is we go around and we follow like Christ, and love people, show them that God loves them, has a purpose for them, that they have unsurpassable worth. And that's a big way in which we can do it. And sometimes we forget that and, and uh, we, we miss that. But our job is to imitate that. What is Christ doing? To live in love, right? So stay away from playing around in sin. Um, show others love. Uh, show them that they have unsur unsurpassable worth, right? To reflect that, to be the salt. Also, we see... Um, in the ancient times, uh, salt had another purpose, which is what we use still today, is as a flavor enhancer, right? It, it enhances the flavor. Uh, I don't know if anyone here puts salt on their food, um, dump it on and brings up the flavor, but, but the salt is a natural enhancer, right? In the ancient world, it was, it was used to bring out the flavor that was already there, right? It was enhance the flavor that was already there. And so as Christians, one way which we can enhance the flavors already there is realize that when we interact with people, when we see people, and people from all realms, all walks of life, uh, don't think that we are bringing God to somebody, right? God is already at work in their life in some way, to, in some way to try to reach them. But when we encounter them, we should be looking and seeing, how can we enhance what God is already doing in their life? How can we bring out what God is already doing in their life? And now, you might think that, well, boy, there's some people that... I, I just don't see God in their life at all. I don't see God working in their life at all. You don't know who these people are. I would just say this, you would be surprised because look at the people that Jesus interacts with. Those are the people that the religious people of the day would say, don't waste your time on them. They are scum. They are sinners. They are just uh, outcasts. They are just not worth it. But that is the people that Jesus went to and said, I am here for them. I am here to show them God's love. Uh, and, and so I, I would just say this is um, try to look past the behavior stuff, which can be tough, and say, how can I partner with God to bring out something in their life, right? And God is doing something in their lives, whether we realize it or not. But then we can look and say, okay, how can I help partner with God to enhance that, to bring that out? Um, how can I reach them in some unique way? What can God use in me that can help reach and enhance what God is doing? It could be a kind word. It could be uh, encouragement. It could be doing something. It could be suggesting something uh, or, or, or inviting them somewhere, whatever. It looks like a million different things. Um, but that is one which we see, you know. Um, here's the thing. When we see Jesus enter the scene, and Jesus comes and he's doing his ministry. He has two things he has to do at the same time. Number one, he has to show people that he is the fulfillment of what they've been waiting for, right? He is, he is showing the Israelites, I am the Messiah. I am the fulfillment of what Israel has always hoped for and longed for. Uh, I am here. And second thing is he has to show them that he and his followers are living in dying by this way, right? It wasn't just lip service or whatever. It, it, it was, it was, it was just a new way of life. This was a kingdom life kind of thing. Um, see, Israel was called to be the salt of the earth, right? And so now Jesus comes and says, be the salt that you were called to be. Now, in this context, he's talking to the Israelites, his contemporaries, but certainly it applies to Christians. You know, be the salt and light that God has called us to be. You know, Jesus comes and... Um, 
Israel was called to be the salt of the earth. But here's the thing. This is what I want us to see. But they were behaving like everybody else. Israel was called to be the salt of the earth, to, pre- to preserve God's truth and what it meant to actually live truly human. But they became like everybody else. They got sucked into the political power uh, fight. They got sucked into the divisions. They got sucked into the military revolutions. And Jesus comes and says, no, 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 listen. That is the opposite of what you were called to be. You're getting sucked into the world, everyone else. Israelites were called to be different, but they got sucked into wanting to look like other nations. They wanted to have kings and rulers, you know, and, and God is not this uh, puppeteer. It's okay. I mean, you, you, can, you can have that, but they became more and more and more looking like the world around them, right? And so here's the thing. Uh, how can God keep the world from going bad, which is, again, salt is preservative, if the salt is no longer salty. If the salt is, is losing its distinctive taste, right? The Israelites, God is going to use the Israelites to preserve something, to be a, the salt of the earth, to be the light, and then they, they lost the taste. They became uh, distinctively the same as everybody else, right? Got sucked into vis- division. Got sucked into political division and political um, things. They got sucked into wanting to overtake the world through military might. Here's the thing, you know, we, we saw what happened in, in, in D.C. with the storming and the riots and things like that, and, and this is not a, anything political, but I would just say this, when you read the Scriptures and Bible, um, Jesus was not a zealot. You know, do you know what a zealot is? A zealot, in the ancient days, the ancient days, there were zealots who were ready and standing by to bring God's kingdom about through military might, right? To, that's what they were going to do. Um, that's what their whole purpose was. Um, and Jesus says, no, no, that is not... That is not the way the kingdom is going to come, no matter what you think, no matter what you try. Um, Jesus didn't, that wasn't his movement. They thought that was what the Messiah would do. Jesus says, no, no, listen, my kingdom is not of this world. It is different. You need to be different, right? So salt losing its saltiness, that was happening to the Israelites, right? That's what happened. Um, uh, and uh, then the question is, okay, what does it look like for the salt to lose saltiness as Christians. Um, we are called to essentially do the same thing, right? To, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, what, what does it mean to lose your saltiness? Well, I would just say this passage is clear. There has to remain a distinctive difference between Christians and the world. There has to be a difference. There, there has to be a distinctive difference between Christians and the world. Now, I'm not talking about a holier-than-thou kind of, we are better than you, or we are the moral truth holders, and and that that kind of attitude. No, that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees had, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a distinctive difference. And so, what does it mean to lose your saltiness? I would say, you, you lose your saltiness when you start doing and saying anything that doesn't look like Jesus, right? And that... To the degree that you lose your saltiness, you lose it, some power to impact the world, right? Now listen, the gospel stands on its own. The gospel stands on its own, but there are things we can do that can either adorn it or that can take away from it, right? Uh, and so if you are a professing Christian, but yet you go out and live like the rest of the world and sin and treat people poorly, do you think that is doing anything to add to kingdom stuff? Or do you think people look at that and say, there's just another hypocritical Christian, right? They claim to do all this stuff, but they don't live any different than the rest of the world. They are the same loud mouth, power hungry, angry, mean, judgmental person than everybody else. And there's no difference. You're losing your saltiness. You know, anything, you, and the Bible talks about different things, indications that maybe are some things that can indicate losing of saltiness. So like, in, I think it's Luke chapter 9, talks about um, some saltiness and um, the importance of uh, having peace with one another, you know? And so if you're a Christian and you ha- don't have peace with each other and you don't have peace with other people, to that degree, you're losing some t- saltiness. Because what? 
Jesus says, what? Well, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Uh, and, and to the degree that you're not doing that and you're engaging in the anger and the division and stuff, you're, 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 you're missing, you're losing some, you gotta stay salty. You're losing, you're losing saltiness, right? Even in, 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 in Matthew, um, talks about, again, suggesting salt and saltiness has a correlation of discipleship, actually following Jesus. So to the degree that you're not following Jesus, you're losing some saltiness. You're, you're losing some testimony to the world. You're not looking any different. You're, you're losing your distinctive taste. You just, you know, in the ancient world, if you have the salt, um, the salt changes the flavor of what it contacts, but what it contacts doesn't change the flavor of the salt. It doesn't change the property of the salt. It's still salt, right? So that's how you can be in the world as Christians. You can talk with people and interact with people, live normal, regular lives, and but not take on the flavor of that, what you're contacting. Do you see the difference there? Not taking the flavor of the world, not taking the flavor of the divisions and the fighting and the anger and the, and the sin, which so often happens within the Christian church, right? Um, again, how, how can God use a people to be the salt if that salt loses its distinctive taste? That's the problem that happened with the Israelites, right? And this passage clearly talks about that. And so you can't, don't hinder your testimony to be salt by taking on the properties of other things, right? Talking about the way you live, the way you live your life. What happens you know, when salt loses its saltiness? You know, in the ancient world too, if you start using salt and then eventually some more dirt and things can get mixed in there and then you try to separate it and some more dirt and things can get mixed in there. And then, but before you know it, if you get a lot of dirt mixed in with the salt, the salt loses its saltiness, it's no longer effective, and the verse says you throw it out. It's no longer good for anything, right? It's no longer salty. It's no longer preserving anything. So there's this balance as Christians, you know, how do we preserve God's truth? How do we preserve um, God's love? There's this balance here. Some people think that you know, well, we do it through politics, we do it through marching and gathering together and overtaking the world, but that's not what is done here. That's not how they do it. You know, one of the ways that the early church transformed the world was through self-sacrificial love in a very oppressive regime. The Roman Empire was not friendly people, you know. And that's one of the ways you see it. And actually, you see, for the first 300 years or so, that's how the church exploded and grew. Christians living self-sacrificially in a world full of tons and tons of different gods, a, a temple and idol for all kinds of different gods, in a world where the, the, the empire um, was not always fair. They weren't wasting time doing some of the things that we see happening today. Um, rather, they lived self-sacrificially. And then what happened, about 300 years, um, Emperor Constantine adopted the uh, uh, Christianity as the official um, religion of the empire. Uh, and now you start seeing something ha- different happen. Now Christians say, okay, um, well, we get a little bit of taste of this. Now we're not going to forget the self-sacrificial love thing is good, but now we're going to conquer through military might. Now we're going to conquer through power, and you see things happen where uh, there's military might involved, and that's not what you see Jesus doing. But you see how you can quickly absorb the thing. So, so, so Christianity, you can quickly absorb things um, that can make you lose the flavor, right? You can lose the flavor of what's happening here. Um, nationalism or things like that that, that might be... And hindrance to what's going on here. So the question is this, um, where does the church look and love like Jesus? Like, if you look out in the world, if you just look in the community, where do you see the church living and loving like Jesus does? Or do you see a bunch of people who are just looking like the rest of the world and you slap the label Christian on it? You know? Christians, are we're, we're called to, to look and love and sound different than the world. And I'm not talking about self-righteous or anything like that. I'm talking about humble, self-sacrificial, loving people that just wants to show people how much God loves them. And there's a plan for them. And again, it's not that you go around baptizing every sin or thing like that. That's not what we're talking about at all. Um, God's moral truths still stand firm and true. And we, we were called to live by them and not play around in sin. Um, but don't be surprised when others that are not Christ followers do, you know. 
Um, but he's saying, listen, and, he, and he's not saying try and be the salt of the world. He's saying you are the salt of the world. You see the difference there? He says, if, if, you, if you are a disciple of Christ, he's saying you are the salt. If you try, Trying and trying and trying to um, do things in terms of behavior can be exhausting, you know, because... Now I just feel like I'm never good enough and I'm trying and striving. But Jesus comes and says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. And he's saying, if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, if, if you have a true deep love for him, if you are a follower of him, he says then, you are the salt. Meaning, you will naturally be salty. You will naturally be giving off light. It's not that you're doing it by your own goodness, right? Rather, the Holy Spirit in you is working through you where you just, people just know something's different about you and, and they see it. It doesn't mean that we're not perfect. For sure, we're not. But there's challenging. And the same thing is true of light. You know, the light, um, the Azure lights were called to be the light of the world. You know? Light. Uh, it, it called to be the light of the world. Think about how, um, you ever see, I know like those bug zappers, you know, the, I, I'm not a big fan of mosquitoes, and, and the bugs go, the mosquitoes go to the light, and, they, and, and they're drawn to the light, or even a moth, you know, they're drawn to the light. When you, when you see a moth going to a light bulb, they're not going to inspect the light bulb. They're going because they're drawn by the light the light bulb is giving off. And that's how it should be for Christians. People should be drawn to the light that we are giving off. I, I love what um, Tom Wright says. He says this. Tom Wright says, uh, in the same way, God called Israel to be the light of the world. Israel was the people through whom God intended to shine his bright light into the world's dark corners, not simply to show up evil, but to enable people who were wandering around in the dark to find their way. As Christians, we'll be living in such a way where people look at the light that we are giving off through self-sacrificial love and through the joy and the peace that we have, and they say something is different about these people. You can live in a world full of turmoil. You can go through all kind of garbage. Your life can feel like a mess. Your, your, your marriage can be having problems. Your kids can be rebelling. You might have financial issues. You see all this stuff going on. And people look at you and say, I don't know how they have a joy to do. I don't know how they're pressing on because I would be out of here if it was for me. They look at you and say, God must be real to this person. Must be very real to this person to be the light of the world, right? That they that Christians were called to be a way that we live in a way that shows people what it means to be truly human. And by that I mean what it means to actually live for the purposes for which God created you, loving God and loving others, right? And then people that they think they know what it means to be human in terms of it's about getting money, it's about getting pleasure, it's about getting power. And they tried it. It did not work, and they say, wow, what is different about these people? Because they seem to have a hope that's greater than what I'm putting my hope into. They're not engaging all the things that the world says that's going to give you life and going to give you enjoyment, but yet they have life and enjoyment. And I'm engaging the things that the world is telling me, do this, and this is what it means to be human and free, but I don't feel free, I don't feel human, I don't feel happy, I don't feel joy. What is different with these Christians that they're not engaging in that, but they have a joy that I wish I could have? You see how your light then is shining to a world that is dark and stumbling around. People are wanting to know truth. People are wanting to know um, what is their purpose. And they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And as Christians, if you live in a way which shows God's love and joy and peace and self-sacrificial love, that is shining a light that will draw people and say, something is different here. This is what it means. But here's the thing. Um, what if the people that were called to be the light become part of the darkness? What if the people that were called to be the light becomes part of the darkness? And I think that is a sad thing that happens within the Christian church, especially in our society. And I've said it a million times, but it's, it's, it, we shouldn't take it lightly that a lot of churches in China, in places that the gospel is thriving, but they're being persecuted and killed for being Christians, a lot of those places that church is saying, do not look to America for the Christianity because they do not have Christianity. They want all kind of games. They want all kind of gimmicks. They want all, all kind of other worldly stuff. Um, I think it was Paul Washer was talking about um, uh, a, a big pastor 
from the underground church, church in China, came to America, and his in one of his first remarks after seeing everything going on, he said, "Wow, it's amazing what you Americans can accomplish without God. Amazing what you American Christians can accomplish without God. Build all kind of big buildings, big all kind of draw people, have all kind of great programs and cool cool technology and things like that. But if God's not in it, what is the purpose?" You can have all kinds of things. They can even be good things. But if it doesn't have God, what doesn't have the power, right? As Christians, we have to be careful to not enter into part of the darkness. Again, we have to remain our distinctiveness. So, but this is, there's a challenge here because you had the Pharisees and the religious leaders that tried to remain their distinct by being self-righteous and we are the keeper of the laws and moral truths. And Jesus said, no, no, listen, you're missing it because your heart is not focusing the other things like compassion and mercy and love and things like that as well. But Jesus says, listen, call to be salt and light. How, how do you do that, you know? Um, Jesus warns that the kingdom of God in his ministry is breaking in, and now there's new covenantal behavior, what it means to be salt and light. Now, we're not talking about just behavioral things, but we're talking about your behaviors, but your heart and attitude are different as well, you know? So now you're living, yeah, you keep the commandments, which is good, but you're not doing it out of self-righteousness, no. You do it out of a humble uh, sense of how much you need God's mercy and grace, or being poor in spirit, and, and you're loving others, and you're, you're going out and making a difference for the kingdom, being salt and light, being different, you know? And so ask yourself, where does the world today need salt and light? Where do they need that? How can we, through Jesus, provide that? You know? How can we be different? Real quickly, I'll just say, you know, this about being salt and light. A couple things we need to think about. Being salt and light. Because this is a very important teaching. Remember, Jesus says, you are the salt and the light. But what good is it if you lose your saltiness, but to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot? Being salt and light. First thing I want us to take away is this. Our number one goal as Christians should be look like Jesus. Our number one goal should be to look like Jesus. Ask yourself, do I look like Jesus? Do, you know, um, I think it's a challenging thing, even, even for myself, you know, as, as, I, as I read the Gospels and I, and I and, you know, we use, use the Gospels, God's Word as a mirror to look at ourselves and do you see Jesus in that? Um, many times I don't, you know. I, I, I look at it and say, I, I do not look like Jesus in many avenues of my life. But we're to conform to the image of Christ. And I'm, and I'm not talking about looking like Jesus at church. You know, we can come here and we can all look very spiritual and all look like we all got it together. And, you know, I'm talking about. Do you look like Jesus to your family members? Do, you look, do, do, you, do we look like Jesus to our spouses and how we treat them? Do we look like Jesus the way we treat our kids? Do we look like Jesus to the way we treat our neighbors? Do we look like Jesus the way we interact with our friends and the people at work? Or do they see someone totally different than what we come here and portray? You know? Our number one goal needs to be to look like Jesus because we are called to be disciple followers, followers of Jesus Christ. Not just people that say we believe in God. That's, that's, even Satan believes in God. Congratulations. We should be called to look like Jesus. And Jesus looks like someone who radically loves all people, even apart from what they look like and what they're doing. Now, again, it's not that he's condoning their behavior, and they'll have to answer, and we'll have to answer for it. That's, some people think, that, oh, if you're nice to people or love people or, or friendly with people who are... You know, that looks like you're condoning what they're doing. No, that's not, that's not what Jesus did, right? Look at the way he's doing it here. And then ask yourself, um, what are some f fundamental elements of being Christian? What does it mean to be Christian? Like, so salt has certain chemical properties that you have to have there to have salt. If you take one of those things away and you add something else, maybe even something good, you might have something good, but it's not salt. You know, so as Christians, what are the elements that have to be there to be Christian? Now, I'm not talking about what it means to enter into 
um, the kingdom or enter into the Christian walk. That comes by faith through Jesus Christ. But once you're there, what comes next? What does it look like? <laughs> Jesus tells you in this chapter, Matthew 5, is, I didn't put it up there, but he tells you. Look what he says here in, in some of these things here. Um, he says, what does, it, what does it mean to be Christian? What, what, what are some characteristics? What does God want from you? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the poor in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. See, this is all in the same chapter. He just described the characteristics of Jesus. Do you have those characteristics? Do I have those characteristics when we go out of these, this place? You know? He's saying there are certain characteristics that if they're not there, it's not Christian. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about legalism, no. I'm just talking about characteristics that are, uh, it's being Christian. It's, it's being Christ-like. That's what we're talking about here. Not doing Christian things, but talking about being Christian. What does it mean of being Christian here? It's not, it's how, you know, there's a difference. What does it mean to be a Christian? What, what does it look like? Um, he's saying that there are certain, there are certain characteristics of, of Christian discipleship. And if those characteristics are not there, you don't have Christian discipleship. You might have something good, you know, maybe it's, it's you know, you're, but it's not Christian discipleship. You're not, you're not a follower of Jesus. If you are a disciple of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to become more serious about actually reflecting his teachings, more serious about actually living the way he lives. That's how you be salt and light. You're not salt and light by just saying you're a Christian and looking like the rest of the world. That's just not, you're losing your saltiness. You're hiding your light. You know? Um, and so that's going to be our number one thing is to look like Jesus Christ in every avenue of our life. Self-sacrificial love, not got, getting sucked into other things of the world. Second thing is this, as we have to think about, is don't hide the light. You know? That's what, the, that's what this passage says is, who lights a lamp and hides it? So as Christ's followers, if we believe the gospel to be true, the good news that will cause great joy for all people, the good news of who God is and what He's done and His purposes for people, um, are we hiding it? And how, how can you hide it? Well, number one, you can hide it by actively never engaging in any spiritual conversations with anybody. I know sometimes we try to avoid this, but... Um, that's why we like, like apologetics, is because it makes you a little bit better engaging in some of these conversations with people about spiritual things. Uh, but and you can do it in a way you're not beating people over the head of the Bible, because that's not going to be effective. That's not. I'm just talking about hey, you know, um, finding a way of speaking into someone's life that you can share about your faith, share about your reasons of the hope that you have, the impact God's had in your life. But even even beside that, one of the ways you can hide your light and maybe sometimes do more damage than anything, is being a professing, claiming Christian and looking like nothing different than the rest of the world. You, you, just like the Israelites, you get sucked into all the political division, you get sucked into the power struggle, you get sucked into the military revolution by force, you get sucked into the divisions, you get sucked into the sin of the world, and you're losing saltiness, and you're hiding the light. And people look at you and say, you know, that's one of the biggest things that people have for not being Christian, is, well, a bunch of hypocrites. A bunch of hypocrites. Say one thing, do another. Look no different than the rest of the world. Now, let's be real. Sometimes excuses are just excuses. But also, sometimes there's validity to the, what they see as, as, as Christ followers. You proclaim this, but you... you I don't see... They don't see Jesus of the Bible when they see you. Right? They see a leader of a political party more than they see Jesus. That's a problem. Don't hide the light. Don't hide the light. And the way you can hide it is the way in which you live your life. You know, to the degree that you're either showing and sharing the gospel or the degree that you're doing harm to it by the way that you're hiding it in your life. You know, that 
No one really know it indifferently. You can't hide it. Um, you got to be different. And then thirdly, we'll say this is, is as you go on to the next thing is, is as Christians, um, our motives must always be for the glory of God. It says that they might see your good deeds and give glory to God in heaven. Our, our glory, our purpose it should not be to get praise from men. You know, and that shouldn't, we live in a world now where everyone wants to get praise from man. You know, um, that's very popular. People desire that. I want to be famous on YouTube. I want to be famous on Instagram. I have this many followers on Facebook. I have all these likes on my things. Uh, um, but the glory should go to God. The glory should, it's not, I mean, yes, it's, everyone likes to be complimented. But look, look at this in John 3.30. John the Baptist says this. I must become, or he must become greater. I must become less. Right? He must increase. I must decrease. It's not about praise for us. It's not about people thinking that we're so good or righteous or holy. No, no. This verse said that they might see your good deeds and give glory to God in heaven. It's all about God's glory, you know. There are, there are humble, small church pastors all around the world, probably in the jungles and in China, that no one knows their names. When they stand before God, their reward is going to be great. It'll probably be even greater than some of these pastors who have churches, mega churches of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Because they humbly serve God, not for the glory, not for the money, not for the power or the prestige. They did it out of a love for God. And so as, as Christians, we're to live out of a love for God that He might get the glory, that people might be led to Him. But when you stand, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, it's not good. He's not going to care how many followers you had on Facebook or how many likes you had on a video or how popular you were. He's not going to care about that, you know. Did, did you follow him? Um, were you a faithful servant? As, as, we, as we think about all these things, you know, I, um, I just want to say as we close this, salt and light. Um, we're called to look different than the rest of the world. You know, we, we are called to look totally different than the rest of the world. You look at even TV shows and the subtle way they, a lot of them kind of take jabs at, at Christians now. It's no, it's, no, it's no surprise that they inherently are linking extreme right stuff with Christianity and they're making it be the same because you kind of see that conflation. Um, but you don't see that in the Bible. You don't see that in Jesus. Our job is to be living so self-sacrificially, so loving, looking so distinctively different than the rest of the world. They say, well, that's just, what is different? Something's different about these people. You know? I know it may not be a popular message. I get it because people are very much entrenched into a lot of things these days that are maybe even good things, but they're outside of Jesus and Christianity. I understand it's not a, maybe a popular thing, but this is what Jesus teaches. He must, he must become greater. I must become less. And so I just say, we go out of these doors. Let's look different than the rest of the world. The world is going to do what it's going to do in many ways, right? Um, even in good times and in bad times, let's look different than the rest of the world. Let's put on display the self-sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. Let's not, lo- let's not get entrenched into sin. That's not, that hurts your testimony. That hurts your relationship with God. Let's not get entrenched with um, other things, of divisions and fighting and lack of peace and and uh, all the other stuff that can draw attention away from Christ. Be smart in the way you conduct yourselves and what you say and how you treat people, what you put online. Because people are always watching. And more importantly, God is watching. But how can we look different? There's a different way of conducting ourselves is what he's saying. You know, what's going on now? It's, it's happened 
in history. Like, this was going on in Jesus' day. Fight political power, people being unfair, unfair abuse, um, outrage of what's going on, immorality, like all this stuff. Like, you read the Bible, this is not like just new in 2021 or 2020. But yet, Jesus says, listen, there's still a distinctive way as a Christ follower, as a kingdom person, to conduct yourself. And if you do that, by reflecting Christ, it, it's a way of being salt, a way of being light in a world that is trying to find it in every other aspect of things, right? They try to find it in all other kind of stuff. Be salt, be light. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ, we need to think about how can I be a better ambassador of Jesus Christ, being salt, being like the people look at me and say, wow, something is different. They have the love of God in their life. They are just so loving and self-sacrificial and joyful, and they're not getting sucked into all this other fighting and division and anger, and, and they still have a peace, even in the midst of chaos. How, do they, how are they doing that? So what's going on? They must have something beyond what I'm hoping for or putting my faith into. Be salt, be light in a world that needs it, right? Don't lose the saltiness. Stay salty. And so that, that should be today's message. Stay salty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every single person here. God, as we live in the time of turmoil and the time of all the things going on, God, I, I just help that we all hear you and hear your call for us to be the salt and the light of the world. And it says we are already. It's not that we're achieving it. It says if you are a Christ follower, if you have the Holy Spirit, you are the salt. You are the light. Now we need to conform to the image of Christ and allow it to shine through. And God, help us to be better ambassadors to you. Meaning putting on display and contrasting with the world. Not in a self-righteous or a better than thou, holier than thou way, but in a humble servant. Just look at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are all those things, characteristics. Let's go back to those. Essential elements of being, being Christian. And God, I hope we see this, this verse is not talking about as Christians trying to organize and march and overtake the world through force for Jesus. The zealots would do that, but Jesus was not a zealot. The verse is saying, no, no. The way you overtake the world is through being more like Jesus Christ. And when you do that, that has a power that goes far beyond any sword, any law, any policy, anything. Because the love of God has the power to transform hearts, transform lives. It is the only thing that has the power to do that. And then when we see that working in people's lives, then we see that manifest in other tangible ways in the world and community. But that's not going to happen until it starts with people's hearts where they are transformed by the love of Christ. And God, let us as a Christian people be a people that rediscover the call of what it means to be salt and light in a world that is dark and seeking. That our lights will shine. And that we just continually press forward and live as faithful Christ followers, even in a world maybe is not doing that. We be faithful and see the power of your love at work. God, guide us, lead us. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>